Excellences, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, allow me to um, congratulate you, Mr. President, on your presiding over the Security Council for this month. We are confident in your leadership, and we wish you every success in fulfilling your duties. Also, I would like to commend your predecessor, the permanent representative of Bolivia, for his excellent leadership in guiding the, the work of the Council last month. Mr. President, we warmly congratulate the people of Eritrea for withstanding the hardship endured under the sanction measures. We welcome the lifting of the sanctions of Eritrea. At the same time, we want to acknowledge the effort spearheaded by President Mohamed Abdullah Farmajo, His Excellence, relating to the normalization of relationship between Eritrea and Djibouti. And we hope that two governments, the two governments will engage in good faith to settle all outstanding issues in accordance with international law. Mr. President, 46 years ago, my country, Somalia, and its leadership was uncompromising and hardly working for sustainable peace, particularly in Africa. It successfully promoted and ensured the peace process negotiations during the crisis between Tanzania and Uganda. Having said that, the federal government of Somalia looks forward to the beginning of the new chapter of cooperation and partnership with all the countries in the Horn of Africa. And we will continue together to strengthen our closer ties forged between the people of the region. Mr. President, the federal government of Somalia goes on record in seeking to lift the sanctions imposed on Somalia since 1992. In that regard, I would like to raise the following points. One, the outdated sanctions on Somalia is one of the longest United Nations sanction regime with the widest mandate. Not only the sanction violate the Somalia's unity, it also not align with federal government's policy to build capable Somali national army. For example, paragraph 11A and paragraph 10C of the sanction regime allow countries to provide or donate weapons to Somali regional authorities without our notification, approval, or proper weapons ammunition management of the end users. Despite our belief that sanctions are followed in principle, it continues to be imposed on Somalia without proper assessment of their effectiveness as a mean to reach Security Council's desired end goal. <coughs> we, once again, stress the importance of having a clearly defined benchmarks to the full lifting of the sanctions on Somalia. If there are no specific steps that are clearly stated and verifiably, the incentive to comply with the UN Security Council demands as well as the effectiveness or such or success of the sanction regime will diminish drastically. Number two, the terrorist groups like Al-Shabaab and ISIL remain a serious threat to Somalia's peace and stability. It has been a year since we have witnessed one of the largest and the deadliest attack on October 14, last year, 2017, on Somalia. Yet with sadness, once again, Somali people are receiving the message of condolences and sympathy from our friends and partners for the deadly attack on Mogadishu on the 9th of November. That claimed the lives of over 50 and injured more than 100. We believe that the Security Council sanctions should target the terrorist groups like al Shabaab, who continue to receive weapons and resources from abroad. The Somali Eritrea Monitoring Group concluded that the October 14 attack, and I quote, while there is no evidence to suggest that the IEDs contained homemade explosives, constructing a 1,200 kilogram bomb by traditional explosive remnants of war harvested will entail a major logistical operations. For example, a Shabab will have had to harvest approximately 6,060 millimeter mortars or 190 TM57 anti-tank mines. 
Terrorist groups like Al-Shabaab and ISIL do not go through the official import channels. As a result, our fight against terrorism becomes more challenging with a large flow of weapons and resources into Somalia. Terrorist groups in Somalia have made use of the existing trade network and short distance across the Gulf of Aden to Somalia. The impact of the war in Yemen is particularly acute for Somalia since we lack the capacity of securing remote areas along our coastal line and borders, the flows of illegal weapons and resources must be curbed by the targeting and destroying the network that provides them. We request from our partners to help us improve our capacity in air surveillance, borders, customs, and law enforcement to control land borders and other access points like the sea and the air. It's the responsibility of the federal government of Somalia to monitor and safeguard its borders. Number three, the build-up base, the build-up of the military base in Berbera continue to be clear defi defiance of the UN Security Council's resolutions and as well as Somalia's unity and sovereignty and territorial integrity. The SEMG has reported for the second year in a row that the establishment of the military base in Berbera constitute a clear violation of arms embargo on Somalia. However, the construction of foreign base and transfer of military equipment is still ongoing with the reported completion date set in 2019. We asked the esteemed members of, of the council, what is the purpose of the sanction if the violations by member state are not addressed by the Security Council? What is the significance of the Security Council resolution if Somalia's sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity is continuously violated in front of our, our eyes. Over a quarter of a century, we have seen a quite number of Security Council issues statement that it's time to supplement them with appropriate actions derived from the Security Council's primary responsibility and the UN Charter for the maintenance of international peace and security. Number four. Subject matter expertise and evidence-based reporting is the best practice to be used in the monitoring of UN arms embargo. However, there seems to be little consideration given to such practice today. Throughout the mandate of the monitoring group, unlike most of the UN panel of experts on sanctions, they have been, uh, they have been based away of Somalia in Nairobi, Kenya. As a result, the group devotes only 20% of their time in Somalia to monitor, analyze, investigate events in Somalia. Although the number of panel of experts of Somalia is one of the largest UN sanctioned regimes, the quality of the report remain mixed due to their remote location as well as the questionable level of the technical and regional expertise. And yet, the monitoring group identified those working for reform as the primary target of their investigation. False accusations, poorly evidenced claims, gossip and political grievances were used to undermine our efforts. The federal government of Somalia will not tolerate individuals and Somali institutions and organizations being named in the report of such uh, no evidence or little evidence. The reputation and the work of many companies and individuals who are working to invest and rebuild Somalia have been irresponsibly damaged and brought into the international question based on rumors and speculations. Uh, in that regard, we welcome the, the, the name change of the panel of experts and we recommend their relocation to better perform their mandate tasks. Moreover, we recommend choosing from a pool of experts with high level of technical and regional expertise to undertake future investigations in Somalia. To conclude, Mr. President, we thank the Security Council for your continued support on Somalia's unity and progress. Terrorism is not only a Somali fight, it's a regional fight, it's also global. 
that we are all united in countering its ever-changing threats. We encourage the Council to look beyond the borders of Somalia and support us in our regional approach to the threats we are facing. This is, only, this is the only way that we will able, to, able us to defeat the terrorism comprehensively and build a lasting peace in Somalia and across the world. I thank you. Okay, she's